Greetings, friend. This is a classic Sudoku sent to Cracking the Cryptic by Kevin Moreland. He found it in this book called Extreme Sudoku. Kevin called it his favorite Sudoku of all time. Mark, good lift, uh, tried to solve it, couldn't, passed it on to Simon saying it was too difficult to solve. So Simon tries to solve it in this video, posted the 15th November 2020, had almost 500,000 views at the time of this recording. And it's called The Simple Trick for Hard Sudokus. Most viewers who saw this puzzle said it was a very difficult break-in. They couldn't place any candidates. And they called this video an essential solving video tutorial for a particular Sudoku, Sudoku technique. What's that technique? Let's find out. I've also added two positive video moments and one what-if moment to help you study some alternate solving paths. And with that, it's solving time. Okay, like most puzzles, Simon starts with simple cross-hatching and scenario notation. Scenario notation, that's the technique where you mark in Canada that restricts to two locations in a block. I'm going to tell you right now, this puzzle is pretty Snyder-proof, and I'll show you why. So first, he saw some twos they could put in block four, and then he also went down and saw some twos he could place in block eight, and then he noticed he could place some twos up there in block six. And then he says... There are some difficulties afoot with this offset Snyder. You've probably noticed that these twos are not in a row or column. They're offset in the block. So he's seen this before, and Simon's saying, this is going to give us some difficulty. All right, after that, he looks through some of the other candidates, and he focuses on the sixes. He was able to mark a two sixes there in block nine, and then he focuses on the sevens. He saw some sevens in block four, and then these sevens here in block six. Uh... He went through the eights and then got to the nines, and he was able to mark these two nines in block nine. And that is it for Snyder notation. You're not going to be able to mark anything else using Snyder, and you notice you haven't marked any, uh, solved any cells. Not really gotten much, not really gotten very far at all. And so at this point, uh, it's about eight minutes, 50 seconds in the video, Simon starts looking for some restrictions in the candidates in particular rows. Why is this puzzle so difficult? Well, notice there are no anchor houses, rows, or columns. If you look at any particular block, they only have uh, two or three cells. You look at a particular row or column, same thing, no more than three cells. So there's no anchor, there's no place to place your eyes. I mentioned this in my How to Solve Single uh, Sudoku Cells video. I'll put a link at the end. What setters, expert setters like Mark and Simon like to do is they like to look where there are a lot of restrictions. That's going to be the cells that have five or more cells, or the houses that have five or more cells filled in. And so setters who do puzzles, they like to add the candidates to kind of telegraph where that breaking is. Um, and if you're doing a variant, you probably notice if you ever see a puzzle, wherever the busiest part of that starting grid is, that's where the most restrictions are. That's probably where you should start looking. I run this through a solver. This puzzle is rated medium. It doesn't require uh, any harder techniques than what I've talked about in my medium tutorial solving video. However, these solvers don't take into account that solving hidden naked singles, hidden naked pairs, uh, when you have this kind of setting where there's no anchor for our eyes, it makes it much harder for us, a human, to figure out where to look. But Simon, he's actually a little smarter than that. So then he said, okay, if I can't find an anchor, I'm going to see how these different pairs work on each other. And he noticed the sevens. There's one, two, three sevens, and he noticed these three. So you have like a three seven here, a three seven here, and a three seven together. And he's like, they're making some sort of restrictions. And so then he said, okay, where are these threes and sevens restricted do they form some kind of hidden pair? And sure enough, he found one along row six. So you probably notice that there's a seven here and a seven there. Well, look at the threes. Where can the threes be in row six? It can't be here, can't be there or there, and it cannot be here. So it's the same spots as row seven. And so what he found was a hidden pair. You have a three seven hidden pair along row six. He then looks at the twos in the seven. Same idea. Two seven here in row two, two seven here, row seven, and this two seven here in block five. Similar to threes. And then he finds himself another 
hidden pair. And what he talks about is communication. He says, you know, look at the pairs, look at their effects on rows and columns. This is really brilliant stuff. When I saw this, I was like, wow, that's neat, because I, I always think about individual cells. I didn't think about looking at pairs like Simon was talking about. And so he spots another hidden pair, and this time it's a long column five. So I'm going to pause the video here. Pause the video and see if you can spot a hidden pair of twos and sevens along column five. Well, I'll give you a few seconds. Okay, congratulations if you spotted it. You are an expert at finding hidden pairs. For those who just want to enjoy the show, the twos and the sevens are in row three, column five, and row eight, column five. And this is key. Uh, once Simon finds this, he feels like he has some hope in looking, in knowing where to look next. And then after solving this two and the seven, uh, Simon looks and realizes there's some more restrictions here. So he's able to place a five and a nine right here. Because then he was going, okay, I'm going to focus on whether there are restrictions. And if there's just two candidates left, I'm going to put it because that's of interest to me. Then he looked over here because he's kind of looking down column five and row six. And he said, okay, there's only two spots here, a one and an eight. So he put that in. And then he looked across row six and he said, okay, row six, column eight, there's only two spots, uh, two candidates in that cell, four and five. He didn't mark these two because there's more than two cells, uh, more than two candidates in those cells. And so Simon tries to be real efficient with his marking. And because he's like, these are the restrictions I need to care about. These two cells aren't really of interest to me right now. And then he's looking to say, I wonder if there's anything I can solve now that I've placed these hidden pairs there. And he ends up looking first up here, row three, doesn't say anything. Then he looks down here in row eight, in column five, and he's like, um, so before it was just a two, seven. This was a one, two, four, five, seven. Well, now you can't have a one or four or five there. And he looks across and he goes, oh, hey, these fours are restricted. You know, four can't be here in column three, can't be in column four, and it can't be here in column seven or nine. So he's able to solve the first cell of this puzzle. And it's a four in row eight, column one. So this brings us up to our first what if moment. What if Simon didn't spot the hidden pairs? Is there another way you could have made some progress in this puzzle? And I'll show you that right now. Okay, so the question is, what if he didn't find these hidden pairs, this 2, 7, 3, 7? What could be done in this situation? And to answer that, um, we're going to have to show all the candidates. So kind of want to show you what it is you can be looking for. And the answer is, you're going to have to use harder, more advanced strategies to make any more progress. And there's two in particular. Uh, and it has to do with the twos and the sevens. Uh, and the strategy you'd use is actually a swordfish. Now you could classify it as an X, Y, or excuse me, an X chain. Um, but I'm going to show as a swordfish is probably a little bit easier to see. I've done more puzzles showing swordfish. And so I just kind of point out where the, uh, the logic is. And now if you're doing a pencil solve like this one, you're not expecting to be using swordfish. All right. So swordfish. Three by three pattern. Let's look at the three here. So you got the two showing. And if you take these cells right here, you'll notice that in these three columns, columns uh, one, five, and nine, the twos are limited to the same three rows, rows three, four, and eight. So that's a sort of, it means in this row, the two needs to be in one of those spots. In this row, needs to be in one of those spots. In this row, means one of those two spots. Otherwise, if you try to put it in like this spot or this spot, it's going to break the puzzle. So you can eliminate any of the twos along rows three, four, and eight that are not colored. So that's not a two. That's not a two. And that's not a two. And this is important. You're actually going to be working on row eight here to make the breakthrough. All right. And so now if you looked at the sevens, uh, you can make another swordfish. Um, and so the swordfish I'll point out is right here. Another three by three. And you know, this book was called Extreme Sudoku, so pretty extreme pattern there. Okay, so look in this same situation in these columns, one's five and nine, same three rows, three, six, and eight. So you can't have a seven there. 
you wouldn't be able to have a seven here or a seven here. And so this is the key. We cleared out these twos and sevens along row eight uh, that, that were extra. And so now what you can do is you look across row eight, maybe you can spot what you see. There's a naked triple now in row eight. And I'll show you the naked triple right here. There we go. And so one, five, and six are now limited to these three spots in row eight. So one, five, six have to be in those spots. Then you can eliminate, you know, the ones, fives, and sixes from all the rest of row eight. And if you do that, you'll notice now you can solve this first seven. Once you solve this first seven, there's only one place left for a seven here, lock six, one place left for a seven here, and, and one place left for a seven. And you can see now you can, you'll start solving the puzzle, right? One place left for a seven there. And you can see you can pretty much solve all the sevens and move on. All right, let's go back to the main solve. Okay, we're back to the main solve. After solving this four, Simon notices now there's some restrictions on the twos. And he's able to solve a two up here in row four, column one. And then he's, he marks some twos uh, down here. He says, okay, there's a two and a two. He makes two, he marks the twos there in block seven. And then he says, oh, wait, hey, I can actually solve a two. Okay, I got a two here and a two here in rows four and six. I can solve for two in row five. So he solves that for a two. Then he starts to go notice, okay, two and a two, two come across row two. Hey, I can actually solve for another two. And then he notices that he's taking away some Snyder marks by doing that. And so he's able to solve for another two up here in row one, column six. And then he's able to come down and says, okay, I just took away that two. I can solve this for a two. And then I, he makes, you know, he can solve one last two down there. And he, just like that, Simon's starting to solve his puzzle. He says, oh, great. I did it a lot with this, the twos there. So then he comes back and remembers, oh, yeah, this is a two seven. That's seven. Uh, I can be solved right there in block two. Uh, then he starts doing some pencil marks where the rest is sevens coming down column four. There's only two spaces left here in block eight. So now the Snyder notation is actually doing us a lot of good. At first it was Snyder proof. Now it's the Snyder notation is helping us. But then he looks and goes, oh, okay, I got two sevens in rows two and three. In column three, only place left for seven up there. He starts solving the seven there. Uh, then he makes some, uh, he notices that he can solve for a four. Because hey, I put the seven right there. And I have a four here and four here. I can mark that for a four. Um, and then, again, looking at the sevens, going, oh, only one place now left for a seven here in block four, and it's right there in row six, column one. So he solves that for a seven. And now, you know, he's kind of taking, pair of the, taking care of those hidden pairs. So this is good stuff. Uh, he focuses on the three, since he got this seven from the three seven pair. He's able to solve that for a three. And then he looks back at the sevens and goes, okay, I can solve that seven and finish off the seven there in row five, column seven. Um, and then he focuses back on uh, looking more at the sevens. You know, where's the last seven in block nine? There's only one place for a seven, so he puts that. And then he knows, okay, it takes that mark. I can solve this for a seven. And now he's taking care of all the sevens. So then he starts looking at the fours. Like, what am I going to do with the fours? He's getting kind of giddy at this point. So he marks a couple fours up here. And he starts looking around. And he says, okay, I think the fours might be running out of gas. So he can't see the next logical place to solve for a four. But in reality, they're not. So this is our second pause the video moment. Pause the video and see if you can solve the rest of the fours while I give you a few seconds. Okay. So you can start here in block six. You notice this four coming across row four. You can solve that for a four, which means you can now solve for a four right here. And you see, okay, four, 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 four. Coming down uh, two fours in rows four and six. And this four means this has to be a four. And then you can finish off the fours right there. That's how you'd be able to solve all the fours and move on. Okay. Now we're back to the original solve where Simon didn't see those fours. Instead, he made some marks with the fives and nines. 
noticing, hey, this is now, you know, I got a five and nine come up this way. So the five and nines are restricted to these two spots in block one. And this means that those are restricted to the sixes and eights. And then after restricting sixes and eights, there's only one place left to solve in column one. So he's able to mark that for a three. And then he starts looking at the uh, threes again. Notice he can solve for a three down here. And then he comes up and notices he can solve for three, come up here in row one, row four, and then uh, you can solve for this three. So he's kind of knocking out all the threes. Now he, he changes his thought and starts looking at the eights. He goes, okay, I got eight here, I got eight there. So he's kind of looking for a bunch of different uh, restrictions. So he's able to solve uh, that eight in row six, column three, and then he says, okay, only one place left for an eight right in block five. So he solves that for an eight. And then he sees now, okay, eight, eight, only one place for an eight right here. So he solves that for an eight. And then he marks some eights down here in block nine. Okay, after that, he sees a three here, notices the restriction. Uh, three can only be one spot in block four. So he solves that for three. Then he notices, okay, the nines have these two spots, so the nine must be here and one must be there to finish off block four. So he marks those. Uh, then he makes some uh, Snyder notations for the ones in block five. They're restricted to row six there. And then he looks at the nines and goes, okay, I have a nine here, a nine here. Well, now they're, they're going to be, the nine has to be there in row four, column five. So he makes that mark for the nine, and which helps him solve for... Uh, he knows there's only two places left. There's a five and a six. So he sees the five right there. He sees the six right there. So he's able to mark and solve those two spots. And there's only one place left now in block six. So he solves that for a four. And at this point, now he, you know, he kind of notices the four. So he goes, okay, I saw that four. And then he solves this four. Uh, then looking across, he notices, okay, I got a five right here. So that has to be a nine. And then... I can solve my five over here in row one, column three, and then I can solve that nine right there. So he's moving along. He's pretty happy, and he's, he's getting a lot of progress here. Then he kind of looks at the ones and notices, okay, you know, these two spots. I uh, see the one has to be there in row two, column nine, and then he finishes off block three by solving that eight. When I solving that eight, you can see he just created, you know, he hit some more of his Snyder notation. So he's able to solve for this eight and the six over here in block one. Uh, and then he kind of changes his focus to the sixes. Okay, I got six here, got six here. Only one place for a six in block two. Marks that up. Um, and then uh, look, now he says, okay, what's left here in block two? And you can see he's just kind of going to like, okay, two cells remaining, one cell remaining. And he's just focusing on the most restricted uh, houses at this point, which makes sense. Um, and I look here, okay, I got a nine. So the nine has to be there, and then I can solve the one and finish that off. And then there's only one spot left for a one and block five. Uh, at that point, he's like, I wonder why Mark had so much trouble. Maybe because he couldn't find those hidden pairs. And so then uh, Simon makes some more marks on these ones, one, one. It makes the marks on the ones. But it was at this point, with 14 cells remaining, that Simon cracks the puzzle. Uh, it's all naked and hidden singles from here, and he kind of breezes through it. So I'm going to kind of go through it real quick. You can solve it on your own if you'd like. Uh, I'm just going to recreate his solve there. So let me know what you thought. Uh, did you try to solve this puzzle on your own? If so, did you get stuck like Simon did? Uh, hopefully you got some benefit out of the what-if moments and the pause of video moments. Uh, please let me know what your comments were in below and don't forget to like share subscribe smart hobbies don't miss any new content come back every day in february i'm going to give you a brand new video it's my month of sudoku in the meantime you can check out some of these other videos from my channel thank you all so much for watching